good morning. morning. Please open up your Bibles to Titus chapter 3. As you're on the way there, please bow your heads with me as I pray. Our gracious, our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, you are magnificent. All that you do is right and just. And as we come before you this morning, Father, we, we ask that you would challenge us and teach us from your word this morning. Father, let us be a church that seeks eagerly to honor you above all things by being faithful and obedient to your word. Help us be diligent to search the scriptures, to understand what they say, and help us to be resolved to the best of our abilities by the empowerment of you, Father, your Son, and the Spirit, to live in such a way that puts you on display not only for the community of believers here, but for a lost and dying world around us. Father, thank you for this small epistle of Titus. And now, Lord, again, teach us great things. We love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We are coming to the... Coming near the end of Titus. Not quite there yet. But as you know, the, the series, or what I've entitled really the, the whole epistle of, of Titus is gospel living. The book of Titus gives us wonderful truths, not only for us individually as believers, but how we are to live corporately with one another for leadership, um, for discipleship, all it really does span the breadth of the Christian life, especially in chapter three, as we move into what our how we're to live in in light of uh, our salvation and what that is to look like to a lost world. And as you know, Titus is a pastoral epistle, meaning that Paul is is writing to a pastor. He's writing to Titus, and he at times directly addresses Titus but also pulls back and gives instruction and exhortation to the the whole church on the small island of Crete. But where we're at this morning is he gives direction specifically to Titus, but again, to to the broader audience as well. And where I want to begin this morning is really with a question what are the responsibilities of a pastor to his congregation? What are the responsibilities of a pastor to his congregation? And I'm just going to rattle some off for you. First, he is to model what it means to exalt God. He is to model what it means to exalt God. He is to be an example in general. He is to lead the church. He is to preach and teach God's word. He is to teach godly living. He is to minister to the sick. He is to evangelize the lost. He is to preach the message of salvation. He is to edify the saints. He is to equip the saints for the work of service within the body of believers called the church. He is to commission future leaders. These are some of the responsibilities of an elder within God's church. But a pastor also has the responsibility to exercise authority for God in the church. He's to resolve differences within the local congregation. And another responsibility is that he is to avoid certain things and to reject certain people. At first mention, 
This may sound unloving. This may sound unkind. It may simply even sound unchristlike. But rather, it is, it is just the opposite. It is loving, it is caring, it is protecting, and it is even purifying. The local church has been placed under the stewardship of its local leadership. The leaders must seek to love, nurture, feed, lead, shepherd, and protect the church. Calling a sinning church member to, repent, uh, to repentance is in fact Christ-like. Caring for and protecting the church from sin is as well Christ-like. Protecting the church from doctrinal error, sin in general, and factious people, that too is Christ-like. Purifying the church through church discipline is also just like our Savior. It is Christ-like. At the offset of today's message, we must understand how God, through his word, commands the church to deal with foolish arguments and controversies and how to respond to factious, argumentative, and self-promoting individuals. Today's message will both warn us and instruct us in how we are to deal with sin in the church. Today's message really has two points, and they are this. We are to avoid the foolish. We are to avoid the foolish. And point two, we are to reject the factious. We are to reject the factious. In today's message, you will see how important the unity of the church is and how seriously God takes the sin of foolishness and divisiveness. One of the things I want to I want to attempt to do today is I want to I want to share with you my own heart as a pastor. But I also want you to understand that in these 3 verses which we're going to be talking about this morning that the weight of responsibility primarily lies on myself and the leaders but on you as well. This is a helpful passage. It's an instructive passage. And it requires courage. Not to stand up here and preach the message. But to consider what this may mean for you and me in the future. A passage like this, it's not, is it going to happen? It's when. And I don't mean to sound I don't, pessimistic. But it's the truth. This will happen. And we need to really discern from the text or from the scripture as whole. Is this loving? Is this really Christ-like? Is this really how a body of believers, a community of God's people is supposed to live? Is this really what we are called to do for one another, to one another? And as you, I'm sure, already know, yes, it is. That's exactly what it means. Look at your text with me. We are going to begin with avoid the foolish, looking at verse 9. And we're just going to read verse 9. Verse 9, Paul instructing Titus says, But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. The first term, but, really, as you know, just sets up a contrast between what we read here in verse 9, what's to follow in verses 10 and 11, between what we've already read in verses 4 through 8. Look there with me. Titus chapter 3 verse 4. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly 
through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. What we just read again is in contrast to verse 9. Foolish controversies, strife, disputes about the law. Paul says these things are to be avoided. Avoided at all costs. The, the, the term avoid is it's a direct command. It's an imperative. It simply means to shun. It means to shun. It means to deliberately abstain from. When I was in seminary for a time, I worked as a security guard. That's where all my gray hairs came from. (laughs) Working overnights, working a graveyard shift as a security guard. It was a good job. I enjoyed it. It was in Southern California. It was next to the high desert. During the summer times, around, you know, the temperatures reaching 90s to 100s, we would get rattlesnakes that would find themselves on campus and inevitably they would at some point find themselves in the dorm of some unsuspecting young college girl. It seemed like it was always the young ladies who had to deal with this. Well, I would get a call and my job as the foolish seminary student was to go and wrestle with this rattlesnake. So I would find myself heading up with some sort of artillery that would hopefully get rid of this snake. And oftentimes I would find myself on the opposite side of where I needed to be in order to directly deal with this snake. And I would have to make my way around this snake. And as you might guess, I would do it with a lot of care. That's this word. It means to deliberately walk around something as to avoid it. And that's what I would do. I would deliberately walk around it in some way or manner or climb or do whatever I needed to do to get on the the other side of it, hoping and praying that it wouldn't find its teeth sinking in my leg or in my foot or someplace else. As Paul writes, he directly addresses Titus as the pastor of the church in Crete of what to avoid. He was to, Paul, Titus was to shun these things that we are going to come to understand more seriously. 1 Timothy 4.7 helps us here. Paul tells Timothy to also shun certain things, to avoid Timothy being the young pastor in Ephesus. And he says, avoid worldly fables in 1 Timothy 4, 7, because these are unprofitable stories and are in contrast to disciplining the mind for godliness. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20, Paul says to avoid worldly and empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, what some have professed and thus gone astray from the faith. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, Paul tells Timothy again to avoid worldly and empty chatter for it leads to ungodliness. And this type of talk spreads like gangrene, he says. This type of worldly chatter that Timothy is to avoid leads to personal ungodliness. And in time, it leads to corporate ungodliness. It begins to affect others. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23, Paul tells Timothy, but refuse foolish and ignorant, ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. His point, stay away from the type of talk that destroys unity. Now, let me just, in recap, here's what Paul's saying. Avoid worldly stories. Avoid empty talk. Avoid foolish argumentation. Avoid childish theories. Avoid rumors. 
These things at best cause quarrels, quarrels, but usually lead to ungodliness and ungodliness that spreads. Some have even abandoned the faith because of such things. Now in Titus chapter 3 verse 9, the Cretan saints were commanded to avoid four errors. And the first one is foolish controversies. The word here for foolish is where we get our English word moron from. It describes someone who lacks good judgment. The idea of foolish is not so much speaking of intellectual deficiencies as much it is, as it is moral deficiencies. It is used to picture people who live life as if God and his will were of no consequence. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 8 says, The wisdom of the sensible is to understand his way, but the foolishness of fools is deceit. It's moral. Proverbs 19 verse 3, The foolishness of, foolishness of man ruins his way and his heart rages against the Lord. The two is moral. Our word here for controversies refers to discussion or debate over controversial issues. The person who engages in this type of discussion is someone who is not genuinely seeking the truth, but someone who is preoccupied with pseudo-intellectual theorizing. The Cretans were to avoid such things. But they were also to avoid the error of arguing over genealogies. This refers to the study of ancestry and probably has a connection to Titus 1. I think it's verse 13 where rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers were called to be silenced because they were upsetting whole families. Do you remember? Of them, Paul commands that they are to be reproved and not pay attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men. Paul is not referring to the genealogies found in the Hebrew scriptures. Those had importance. Those were necessary. Also those that we find in Matthew in the New Testament. These were necessary in determining the lineage of priests, kings, and even the Messiah himself. But Titus is not to be concerned with fanciful and allegorical interpretations of genealogies as these prove both unprofitable and even worthless. Now the third kind of error that the Cretan saints were to avoid was strife. What this is, is bitter disagreement between conflicting facts, claims, or opinions. What are in view here are those who like to argue selfishly over the truth as well as dispute and quarrel over claims and, and, and opinions that really don't lead to anything. Regardless of the disagreement, Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.24, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome. That is not to characterize one of God's saints. Christians are not to be fighters with their words. This has more to do with their heart motive than it does even their tone. This is something that we too must be careful about. And I just, I just want to encourage you and, and maybe even challenge you. Those of you who at times like to play devil's advocate, be careful. Be careful. This is something that I think we, we must caution ourselves in. I have observed many conversations in which someone who's attempting to be a devil's advocate soon leads to ungodly bickering. Once you see the conversation begin to take this turn, let me encourage you, cease, stop. Don't allow the conversation to erode into an argument, something that began with just playing a devil's advocate. Be careful not to cause your brother or sister to stumble, because in fact, that's what you may be doing. The fourth and last kind of error mentioned by Paul is disputes about the law. This word refers to bitter word battles over the Mosaic law and applies to trying to make permanent the transient aspects 
of the, of the Mosaic law. It also questions how to apply the authority of some aspects of the law. An example of this is found in Galatians chapter 6. And I'd, I'd like you to turn there with me, please. Galatians chapter 6. Look at verse 12 with me. Galatians 6.12, those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. Now this passage refers to the issue that took place in Jerusalem in which the early church called the Jerusalem Council. This council was called in order to deal with the Judaizers who were legalists and were teaching salvation by works. In this council were men like Peter, Barnabas, and James. And James, who functioned as really the leader of the Jerusalem church, and he judged it to not be a profitable thing to trouble true believers with the yoke of the Mosaic law. The role of the Mosaic law in the life of the Christian is settled, really, in Galatians, but pointing back to Acts 15. There is no reason for us as Christians to have disputes about the law. Paul instructs young Timothy in the same way that he has just instructed us, Titus by saying in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, as I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. Verse 5, he goes on to say, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. For some men straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting, be, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. These teachers here, these false teachers, they wanted prestige. They weren't true teachers of the law. They were not concerned what the law truly was saying. They were concerned with their status and their place and their role. They preach a salvation of works completely void of the truth. These men really are further summed up for us in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3, which says, If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, what's it say? He is conceited. And understands nothing. But he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and dispute about words out of which arise envy, strife, ab strife abusive language, and evil suspicions. And constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth. And that is why Paul says in our passage, what's the result? They are unprofitable. These things are worthless. In Hebrews chapter 7, verses 18 and 19, the author of Hebrews refers to the law as being useless and weak because it doesn't save, because it doesn't regenerate. How much more disputes about the law and the rest, strife and genealogies and foolish controversies, they are all empty. They are all empty. What we are to be about, saints, we are to be about the gospel. We are to be about good deeds. He says that for, for us in Titus chapter 3. Verse 8, this is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. 
We know what we're to be about and we know what we are not to be about. And what this passage is talking about, because some of you go, well, genealogies? Is that really what I would find myself arguing about today? Probably not. Probably not. But what we are not to be about is foolishness, unwise, or selfish questioning, speculation, controversy, or argument. Be careful what you spend your time doing. Be careful what you spend your time reading. We are not here for very long. Read those things that are most essential. Read those things that are going to build up your faith. Read those things that are going to ground you in the gospel and that are going to compel you to do good deeds. It is one thing to have sincere questions, but it is something altogether to question with selfish motives. We must be careful. We are not to be about strife and controversy, arguing about words or in bitter disagreements between conflicting opinions. Be careful with your opinions. We are not to wrangle over words, over areas of opinion. We are to be men and women of the truth. We fight for the truth. We combat for the truth. We put the armor of God on so that we can battle for the truth. And we are not to be about arguments and opinions about the law. Those things are settled. Those things are settled. When a careful study of scripture has already instructed us in regard to our relationship with the law, we don't go back. We don't go back. We must, saints, be resolved to avoid those things that are foolish. We must be careful. Oftentimes, we can find ourselves being caught up. We need discernment. We need the discernment of one another. But we are not just to avoid the foolish. We are to reject the factious. We are to reject the factious. This is verses 10 and 11. Look at your text with me, please. Titus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. Reject a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. In general, the church, we, dear saints, we do not look at factions or factious people within, within the church community as seriously as we should. We do not take it into consideration as seriously, and we don't address it as seriously as the word of God addresses it. In the forming of the church, God broke down the barriers and boundaries by bringing together Jew and Gentile. God established the church as the bride of Christ. Church, dear saints, the church is to function in a one flesh relationship with the groom. We, the bride of Christ, are in a one flesh relationship with Christ. There should not be factions within us. The church is to be a model of unity, not just with Christ, but with one another. To the Ephesian church, Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, Therefore I... The prisoner of the Lord implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. One element of walking in a worthy manner is being diligent to preserve unity, to faithfully uphold and maintain unity. Similarly, Paul says to the Philippian church in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, Paul says, Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you. That you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. When people think of TCF, 
This is what we want them to think of. Now, saints, we don't look back, but we do look forward. Today, right now, is this us? There's a difference between striving, being resolved, being focused, being intent on one purpose, and just not arguing. Right? Any church, anywhere, can get along and just not argue, not bring up the difficult things. Not necessarily be courageous to talk about the hard things, the difficult things. Not to be united. Because they're not arguing. But to be really intent. To be really focused. To again, be really resolved to be going in the same direction. I feel as though I bring this up often, but it really is. It's a courageous faith that we live. It's a courageous faith that we have. A courageous faith doesn't mean when my brother or sister sins against me in a serious enough way where I should bring it to them that I don't. That's not intent on one purpose. Intent on one purpose is saying love covers a multitude of sins and if this were that type of sin where it was minor enough or 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 minimal enough, or just something that was no big deal, I could just overlook it and no big deal, then then I would do that, but I can't. I must come to you. Scripture demands that I come to you, and I come to you in love. I come to you with eagerness to win you over, and I come to you because I want you to understand what, what has happened. And you explain that situation. You talk to them, and you seek to win that brother, and you seek to win that sister, So that you can truly say we are intent on one purpose. We are striving to be focused with that type of desire for unity. Philippians 2.2, Paul says, Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit. Again, intent on one purpose. That we must... Seek to do that. And anything less of that, anything less than being really intent is really not fulfilling this this passage. The church is to be known by its love, love for one another and unity. Unity is a natural outflow of true biblical Christ-like love. Factions and and a factious man are contrary to God's design and plan for the church. But the point in Titus 3 is is really the divisiveness and disruption that that factions cause. That's really the heart of what Paul is going after. The unrepentant person who causes this sort of turmoil within the church is to be rejected by the church. This issue may be, I'm sorry, the issue might be trivial, but quarreling about it is not. That's important. How a quarrel, how a fight, how how factions begin may be something really, really silly. And it and it you know looking at it later you may look back and say, you know, well we've all been there, right? You've got an argument with someone, you know, six months, a year later someone says, hey, why did you and Fred get in that argument? No no offense, Fred. But why did you and Fred get in that argument? Well, what's what happened? And you say, you know what? I don't even remember. I don't even remember, but I still don't like it. No, I don't even remember why this happened. But that's not the issue. That is not the issue. Quarreling, bitterness, strife, that's the issue. Consider these passages and just write them down. You don't need to turn there. You know them. Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17. (coughs) Excuse me. 
If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. I sort of abbreviated that passage, but the the main points are there. Paul says, Jesus, of course, said that. Paul says in Romans 16, verses 17 through 18, I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus, I'm sorry, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. We are to watch, watch carefully those who cause dissensions. Keep your eye on them, Paul says, and turn away. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to to the tradition which you received from us. The term here for unruly refers to an undisciplined life. The tradition referred to here are not referring to Paul's ideas or the traditions of the Jews or simply of men, but these are the traditions of Christ and therefore laid out for us in the word of God and are to be taken as authoritative and binding. But we are to keep away from every brother who leads an undisciplined, unruly life. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 14, if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Really can't get much clearer. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Verses 9 through 13. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I do not at all mean with immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what, I, what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? But those who are outside, God judges. Do you remember the last phrase? Remove the wicked man from amongst yourselves. Powerful, strong words. Strong challenge for us. To reject a factious man means to have nothing to do with or to refuse someone who is divisive primarily due to their self-chosen opinions. The person who is schismatic and divides is to be rejected and Paul instructs the young pastor by telling him only give one or two warnings. The type of person who is willing to selfishly divide the church due to either them not getting their own way, giving in to foolish arguments, unable or unwilling to see the bigger picture, this person is to be warned twice. The term for warn means to admonish. It includes instruction, correction, and warning with a view to regaining the offender. The goal here is to win them. That is the goal. That is always the goal. The goal is never to get rid of them. The goal is always to win them over, to bring them back, to restore fellowship, to restore fellowship not only with you, with them, them with the church, but restore fellowship with them and God. The term is used in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4 speaking of fathers and how they are to bring their children up in the discipline and instruction. It's the word instruction and the discipline and instruction of the Lord. 
This, the goal of this warning is, again, to win the person. And 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 and, and through 26, six, they, a, that passage gives us the sense of our text. And it says, The Lord's bondservant, again, must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all. Able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. It's a great passage. And how it helps us is because when we read Titus and it says, you know, reject the person, oftentimes I think for us, for me included, we can think where it's, it's sort of a, it's, it's sort of, it has an, an, maybe an angry tone. And that person who's divisive, it, it, it maybe draws in your mind a picture of you coming before them, rejecting them, getting in their face. That's not what the text says. The idea here is first you go to them and you plead with them. And then you plead with them again. And if they still refuse, then the rejection comes. When we go to them, we go to them graciously, humbly, mercifully. We come to them eager again to win them over. But if they cannot be won over, after one or two warnings, it is then again that they are to be rejected. And why? Why? Why is this to happen? Well, Paul tells us, what does it say? What does it say in your text about this person? Beyond a shadow of a doubt, because it says knowing, knowing, you know this. The idea is you've experienced it. You've observed it. You know, you know that this person is perverted. They're sinning. And in fact, they are self-condemned. They are self-condemned. The term here for perverted means twisted, warped, corrupted. This does not refer to a person who who has once made a mistake, but someone who is in a state of perversion and has an unrepentant, hardened mind. That's, That's important. That's a qualifier for us. This person is in such a state of rebellion that they are perverted. Their mind is warped. Their hearts and their minds are in a state of rebellion. They are hard hearted. They are like Pharaoh. In the book of Exodus. And he was unwilling to listen to the admonishment of Moses. The person is constantly sinning by his persistent refusal to receive correction. This person is self-deceived, deliberate in his sin, and deliberate in even possibly leading others astray. And it says that they are self-condemned. This is the person by their own words, actions, and or behavior demonstrate their own worthiness for condemnation. We know, saints, factions occur for many reasons. Even verse 9 gives us different examples of things to avoid in order to stay away from things that can turn into factions. Avoid foolish arguments. Avoid speculative conversations where where the truth either is not at hand or is unattainable. Avoid bitter disagreements at all costs. Avoid arguments over secondary issues. Give grace where you can, and if you can't, leave quietly. But if a faction arises, Paul tells Titus, reject the factious man twice. A factious man is not a factious man by himself. And all I mean by that, in order to be found out to be a factious man, he has had to have already opened his mouth and shared his thoughts with others. Me, standing here right now, you do not know if I am a factious man. It is after I've shared my disturbance, my frustrations, my anger, my disapproval with someone, and then someone comes to you, then you know. I am a factious man. 
At this point, it is no longer a personal sin. It is a public sin. The person whom he has shared his opinion with, it is that person's job to confront. You know, it's the same thing I tell my children. One of my children runs to me and says, so-and-so did this to me. Did you talk to them? You go back and talk to them. After you've talked to them, then you come talk to me. That is how we are to handle disputes within the church at every level. And I will tell you, I don't want to hear it unless first you've gone to them. Confrontation first takes place one-on-one, always. This is the first step in addressing sin. What do we do if the factious man doesn't repent? It moves to the realm of getting others involved. Matthew 18, again, sort of lays this out for us. If the person who first heard the factious information does not confront the individual and someone else hears about it, then it moves directly into what we would maybe consider step two of church discipline, where two or three go to this person. In our passage, this is the first warning. I think what's happening here is Paul is simply saying that one-on-one didn't occur. It's jumped into step two. If Titus hears about a factious man, it has already gone beyond the point of, again, the one-to-one. It moves into step two. And if that factious man continues in sin, it is to be brought before the church and the faithful members of the church that are called this man to repentance. And as you know, if the factious man does not repent, he is then at that point, and only then, no sooner than then, than that point, he is to be rejected. He is to be treated as an unbeliever, and the gospel is to be a part of every conversation with this man. This man's soul is in the balance, and he needs to repent, and you, dear saints, very well may be the tool that God would use to bring that man to repentance. Church discipline is a grace to the congregation. Church discipline, dear saints, is a grace to the congregation and a mercy to the sinning individual with the goal always being repentance and restoration. Saints, now, this is so clear. So clear in how we are to handle factious individuals. How we are to handle this type of sin in the church. None of us hope for this. None of us want this. And in fact, we pray that this will never happen that, so that we would never have to be that tool in someone's life. But Paul understood, understood that Titus, who's in a church that's, that's, that really was falling apart, he knew that this was going to happen. The same instruction was to Timothy and Titus, or to Timothy in, in, in Ephesus. We see examples of this, like we've read throughout Scripture. This will happen, and we just must be ready to respond biblically. But biblically, and I I think this is clear, biblically in no way means ungraciously, without love, without compassion, without empathy, without concern, without care, without prayer. It means all of that. It means all of that. What is at stake, dear saints, is the purity of God's church. What's at stake is not only the purity of the church, but really the salvation of the factious man or woman. Because at that point, they've gotten to the the point where we don't know. We can no longer discern by the way that they're thinking or the way that they're acting that they would indeed be born again. So at that point, it becomes a rescue mission. At that point, it becomes their soul, again, being in the balance. And saints, we need to be lover of souls. We have the message of reconciliation. And sometimes that means we bring it to someone who was once of us, hoping 
that they will come back to us. We avoid foolish controversies. It begins there. We avoid foolish things. And then if it goes beyond that, we reject the factious man. That is, that is what we are called to do. Thank you.